Thank you. I'll try to combine the two lectures from personal view. First of all, I'm very happy that we have GD scan and we can shift the Pergamon Museum from Berlin to Beirut. <laughs> this is very useful, so there's a lot of exchange that we can do. No, but I try to, do, to combine this, both presentations on destruction and muscle from personal view. And this personal view starts last week when I was in Magdeburg. And Magdeburg is a great city in the 10th century. It was one of the leading centers of trade and culture in early modern periods, but then it was destructed in the 17th century and it was heavily bombed like many other cities in the Second World War. When you come today to Magdeburg and you look for the medieval city, you will find the very important cathedral reconstructed. It looks very nice. It's a, the oldest Gothic cathedral and the, and the court in front of it was redone. So it's um, very nice to see uh, this place. But when you can go away from that very place of the city and you try to find out a bit more of what is the history of this important city, you will come into an area which is full of soul, free for soulless construction of modernism, post-war modernism, here in the east of Germany, of a radical modernism of socialist new society, which erased history of the past in the, terms of recon in the time of reconstruction. It was not only the war that changed the cities, but it was also the reconstruction. This had not happened only in East Germany, it happened also in West Germany. By going away from and departing from the bloody history of Germany, cities were remade. Köln, München. There is a very interesting book on München Seconds Deconstruction. It was the reconstruction, where you have an erasure of a lot of what is the memory of this country. For me, as I was born 20 years, two years later, um, after the end of the Second World War, the memories are gone. So I may have found some pictures in picture books and have a, see something which is there, but it's not connected anymore. It's not anymore a living memory. May ask my parents or friends of parents, and they can tell me a bit about also my home city, but the memory, the space where things happen, the culture that lived, will live connected to these spaces. The cultural practices of that time, they are gone, and they are not replaceable. They are not able to bring back. In 1992, I went for the first time to Lebanon, not knowing that I was going to live for quite a while in the region. I was living with, uh, going back with, with, with old people, with uh, people in their 70s, not, not that old, but um, they, were, they were in Beirut last time then in the 1970s. So they, had 20 years almost of not being in the city, and the city changed to destruction. I went with them around, and it was very fascinating to see that they would, could stop on a place which was empty or totally destroyed, and could remember. I remember we had the coffee then in that corner. That was nice. We had this was had always, always good uh, newspapers, and we had a good croissant coffee over there. So the memory was connected to a space which was not anymore connected. And this is what I try to, 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 to shed light on, this relation between space and memory and how documentation and education museums and of course heritage organizations may play a role in that. If you go today to the Middle East, we saw the horrible pictures you have in Iraq, the many destructions with Nimrud, Nineveh, Hatra, Mosul. It looks like a bit like the Cultural Revolution in China. It looks a bit like the socialist new society after the Second World War as a kind of deliberate, deliberate amnesia, not an ethnic cleansing, but a cultural memory cleansing um, of those cities where you have the destruction of spaces, not only to show the new almighty gang which is over there, but also to create, to go away, to, to talk, depart from history and start something very new. Worst, because as we saw with Mosul, Mosul was a great city. Mosul had all that what Islamic societies can be so proud of. Mosul had monasteries next to the mosques. And the 13th century, great Mosul metalwork, which is unique in world history, had always symbols of Christianity, Jewish communities, and of course Islam. So the, co the coexistence of plural societies in the Middle East was something very strong.
not only about, about different communities, but also about different practices. Sufism, for example, one part in Islam which is very important, or the uh, popular culture to pray to holy people, to prophets or to holy people, were shared by almost everyone. So whatever religion you're from, you would go and have a common cultural practices in front of those places. And this is gone. This is Islamic culture, which is destroyed. Also, even those places with like Hatra. Hatra is a fascinating city like, like Palmyra, where you have the, the connection between the East and the West. If you East and the West of those times of the past, where you had the Eastern Mediterranean, so let's say the Hellenistic, Roman, then later Byzantine realm of culture, and then the Mesopotamian or Iranian cultures with Achaemenids, Parsians, and Sasanians. And Hatra, like Palmyra, were those cities where, in the middle of this, some on the Limas, the Lima city, the, 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 the border, but the border was always also a crossing point of knowledge, ideas, trade, and exchange of people. So these cities like Palmyra, they are places which are rich of human experience. If you saw the two temples of Baal and Baal Shemin, they were made for two different traditions of gods, the one from the Eastern Mediterranean, the other one coming from the Iranian world. So if you look to those towers of the tombs that are over there, and you look to the local graves, which are they have the picture of the embedded there in, uh, in stone, carved in stone, or sometimes larger graves with people lying on a clean on a, on a bed, and you look to their dressing and their fitting, you would see that it's a perfect mix of Eastern and Western cultures. So it's extremely rich for Syrians to say, or for Iraqis to say, we are proud of this melting together of cultures and we produced it. On the other hand, it's also for Islamic culture very important. If you go to Hatra, then there are sp specific architectural elements called Iwan, which are there from the Persian period, but which is then very important for Islamic period as well. Or if you go to Palmyra and you follow the footsteps of uh, Khaled uh, Assad, who was so tragically murdered, he was excavating with the Polish team the Decomanos, the main street of Palmyra, and could find the shops of the Umayyad of the early Islamic period inside. So he could really trace back the development of what we say is so typical Islamic, the souk, the bazaar, back to how a Roman main street is changing over time in Byzantium and early Islamic time. And this connectiveness of culture, which is all over there in the Middle East, is something which made Islamic culture so strong. And how then to connect back to it, to his memories, is difficult and not. Because people who lived there, maybe they might not be scholars, maybe they might not be seeing those what archaeologists would see between the stones. But at anyhow, they made their stories, it's their property, which makes them sense to them. So they have the stories of Palmyra, which everyone knew in, uh, knows in Syria, which is that of Queen Zenobia, Queen, of course, almighty and beautiful, how queens are when they are very strong. This was, in the common memory, very strong. It was 200, in the 270s, around 270, this took place as a local force um, being strong as the Romans. But Zenobia was something which was then becoming a symbol for, every, for everyone who needed a symbol. Um, Specialists, of course, of, 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 of course, of also the female movement in Syria. But then, if you go to these places, you see that school classes playing there in the theater are people coming for a picnic. So they take the heritage as they are there and use it as they want. Maybe not like scholars would say that, but this is not totally correct. But they take property of their property and make it their part. And this is so tra tragic, and we need to reinforce this um, connection um, with those places. And the problem is that this amnesia, this forgetting and detaching of, its, of one's heritage is really then very difficult to reconnect, except of invention of traditions and invention of history. And in Syria, it's all over. We saw this, this awful places of the looted places. Um, the, the, uh, Apamea, Apamea, I remember Apamea was a great street with wonderful columns 
um, at the main part, uh, the main street of the city, and where you had all the rest of the part was still sleeping under green fields, and you were uh, thinking that oh, one day there might be scholars excavating it and and writing the history of Upper May, which is one of the greatest cities of antiquities. But also all the other details, the stories of the ancient Middle East, where you have the development of the alphabet, of the writing, which is part of our history. Or also the, the Czech Christian Middle East, which is very important, which is very often forgotten, and unfortunately not through illicit excavations that we like we have in Upper May and there, Dura Europos, and so on and so forth, but also through bombing by different parts, not only the IS, it's uh, everyone is destroying culture in Syria. And the latest one was in Sergilia, one of the dead cities, a great, great city um, of the Byzantium period, 5th and 6th century, where you have a ch church standing like, like, an, on the, like to the roof and the houses of that period, which were still standing there. And you could visit them, and now a Russian bomb hit most of it away. Or if you go and then to to, to Aleppo and Homs, where you see where the barrel bombs and the tunnel bombs were exploding to erase much of the urban fabric. Aleppo was kind of researched, but still today, every day, I think, I say how good it had been to research a city more, because Aleppo is not only a question of mosque and souks, they are the souks of the Middle East, and here you have commercial history, cultural production, of many hundred years and very, very, of a very high culture. If you go to the houses, all these wonderful houses of Aleppo, you find in every house running water of the early modern period. So when we had in Europe no water in these houses, you have a coexistence in these houses and the urban fabric that you couldn't find in Europe. There is a cultural level which is extremely high, and this is next to the material culture, of course, the intangible culture of songs. Aleppo is famous for its songs and, and music, for its textile producing, for its olive um, uh, soap producing, for its kitchen. Its kitchen is very good, or oh, was, um, and many more. And this is all as a fur, um, fabric is gone. It is people leave. It may be not the, the, the souk can maybe reconstruct it, but will it be ever be the souk that we know of Aleppo had been before. Homs is even worse. Homs, we don't know anything, there was no, there's no proper research on Homs, uh, which had beautiful houses on the 15th, 14th century and, and later, of course, and was going back like Damascus and Aleppo and Jerusalem, all the cities of that area, to uh, Rome Street, great. Homs is lost uh, in the memory, like Hama was in 1982. So what can be done? This is very depressing on the one hand side, and um, there can, uh, there's nothing to, to, to make away this loss. It's like in the Visa German cities, these things are gone. You can maybe reconstruct a few things, but it's um, pain and it's nostalgia for, for generations later. But however, we need to go on, and um, also this is a German story, to can, you can go on, um, and we need to help to continue producing culture and reconnect to the cultural heritage. At the museum we do this on one hand side with a project that we do together with the German Archaeological Institute, the Middle Eastern section, and um, our Museum of Islamic Art and with the German Foreign Ministry, that we um, try to build up a kind of natural archive, of an archival uh, system of all the material that we have here in Berlin. And now we're going much more beyond. We have, so far we have 150,000 um, digitized items that we put on the database and connected to a damage assessment. Um, we're looking to, together with the ancient Middle East uh, Museum of the State Museums, into the illicit traffic and how we can respond to it, awareness rising, and um, uh, we'll try now the next step, hopefully, to go to Syria, connect to local archives, and um, put them together. I come back to that. Uh, project. So museums, and I'm here as a representative of the Prussian um, Cultural Heritage Foundation. Um, you have the State Library, which is one part of it, uh, with their digitization project, which are enormous because they have the literature knowledge, the knowledge of Middle Eastern societies, and of course of others, um, in their stores, and it's extremely important to 
scan them, to make them available, to share our knowledge. And for the moment, they are not in danger, but you never know when a fire or a war breaks out. Not war doesn't look like in Germany right now, but a fire could be any, any time that uh, breaks out. So we have um, a lot of issues going on here in the State Library, but then we have the other part, which are the museums, 16 museums, which are a unique archive um, of many millions of objects uh, on the history of humankind from the very beginning to today um, in different ge geographical sections. So there are a lot of digitizing projects, normally one, normal ones, and so far, some of you may smile, we uh, digitized some 500 um, objects uh, from the stores, 3D. Uh, you know, germs are a bit slower, but then very thoroughly, very gründlich in when we're doing something. Now we hope that we, um, that we hope we found it now a center where we um, connect under the head of the Ancient Middle East Museum, for the Zerche Museum, where we try to combine the different 3D projects that we have in <coughs> state museums um, into a, a, a documented center that we um, not only digitizing great objects like our Neshatta facade we're going to, to scan 3D, but also going systematically to and collect what is done already, mainly by museums of archaeology, like the ancient Middle, uh, Egyptian Museum had did some works on uh, a great uh, objects from their collections, um, but also uh, the reconstruction of heritage sites, like the Egyptian Museum had done, but also the ancient Middle East Museum and the Museum of Antiquities. These are the most active ones um, next to those 3D presentations that you have normally, uh, like Google Art and others, to present um, things to the public. So we can do this and do this for research and hopefully help ICOMOS one day or somebody else to reconstruct. So we need a network of those initiatives working together. And with UNESCO, we try to do that on a lower space, on a lower level, as we have for the moment not, let's say, the political will to have a major institution um, playing this role. If you think about Israel and USA not paying UNESCO and other ones being also hesitating, we have a problem how to call the politics to say we need somebody who takes care and takes leadership. So why we don't have this UNESCO that helps us and uh, empowered as they could do. They're doing great jobs, they're doing a lot, but they need to play a much larger role. And uh, uh, ICOMOS is doing quite a lot now also. Um, but we need more to to, to where you have a combination of uh, initiatives like from the different countries, and there are quite a lot of Syrian initiatives in around, and to connect them through an international cooperation. So this is very important cooperation. The other thing is very important is um, awareness rising, is how we can use this material that we have in education programs, in public campaigns, to make people more aware. This is in Germany and European countries or around the world very important for the illicit, illicit traffic. So if you make clear that it's not funny to have something ancient Middle Eastern to have at home in your cupboard and being proud and show other friends how important or how high your cultural knowledge is, that this is maybe the wrong understanding of it. If we change this, like we change so many things by, not by politics, but by public awareness, think about the economic, uh, the, the ecological movement, think about how, uh, how, what happened to South Africa. This happened not to politics, this happened to people that were aware of something, but is correct or not correct. And this PC campaigns need to be done very much for the illicit traffic. traffic. Um, the other hand, of course, UNESCO is a very important partner and was hashtag, uh, uh, not, sorry, I'm always forgetting the name, um, United for Heritage hashtag. Uh, we try to, to work with UNESCO together, this is the Prussian Foundation, to make more awareness. But we can talk about, to call about politics, find problems here and there. The main, for me, the main issue is to connect the very important documentation projects that we find this today here, and which is a great project to do um, here by CYRAC, to digitize 3D, but to connect that with memory. Because without this memory, we may reprint objects, we may have them 
somewhere archived, but they need to be meaningful for society because heritage is meaningless if it's not touching our identity. Of course, documentation is always for the next generation. We never know what it's for. Documentation is always something like we need to do anyhow. But how to make it meaningful and to fight this amnesia that Navid Kamani was talking about um, for this presentation uh, at the uh, Frankfurter Paul's Pleasure for the uh, Peace Prize of the Book Fair. I don't know, in Germany it's quite known. It's, he gave, gave a wonderful speech and he was saying this is what is happening right now is a production of amnesia to <coughs> detach people from their own memory and that today these societies are in a crisis of getting back to their rich and having a rich um, multiple plural intellectual production Islam that we know of from our history and that we know also of course from our friends who are still active but not always in the majority. So education needs to be done and we at the museum for example are for example going into 600 schools to talk about this uh, connection between heritage and our own history and seeing the trans-regional trans-cultural connectiveness of art which is everyone who is in cultural history and art history and archaeology will say directly that art and culture is never falling from the sky with clear limits but it's based on interaction between people and this interaction is very important for us today also in Germany to say if Islam part of our country or not and for people who are dealing with culture, we're saying yes for a long time, maybe not by people, but to cultural products, to ideas. Without the Oud, the Arabic uh, guitar, you wouldn't have rock and roll because in Germany there were no, uh, no, no a guitar in, in here in Europe. So the interaction between these cultures, they are very strong for a long time and they changed our societies as well. If you bring that to people, also we should stop them to exclude the other saying oh look what happened in the Middle East those people from uh, they don't know about their own culture and they are barbarous and they have they don't they are not pluralistic and so on and so forth but if you're looking to to Islamic history you have a totally different picture from what you see today on the television so this needs also be clear in our minds because um, we should not make people guilty for something happening in the country that they're suffering from because it's their property which is destructed and we could not sell them here you are responsible for it. But they're suffering as Germany suffered. One other, of course, England suffered and all the others suffered. Um, so, heritage, memory, need to be connected more and more and this needs to be also done by, for example, going to the mosque communities, what we're right now doing and starting next month also a project, peer-to-peer -peer guidance in Arabic from trained guides that we train um, to uh, people coming from Syria and Iraq in our museums, but always connecting them again transregional and bring them to the German example, also to the German historical museum, where they see how cities changed. And even if you have a big loss, and I'm my person feeling when I go to Magdeburg, I have this melancholia. I still I don't know the stories. I don't have the memory, but I feel there is a loss. But when we tell them that even if I have the loss, look also the cities there surviving. They can be reconstruction partly, or like the city hall of Warsaw, the Schloss of Park Warsaw, which was destroyed by the Germans, and that Hartzing is always talking about. That we can really rebuild something on the one hand side, but we can also produce new things connected to our heritage. So please visit these places and see how culture lives and connect the documentation to education so that we can, from these wonderful projects, learn and make benefit for our societies in looking to answers of the question of today. Thank you.